Well, welcome Jews and Gentiles to the first annual CCU for Israel. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the director of the Centennial Institute at Colorado Christian University. Joining us this evening are Christian and Jewish community leaders, rabbis, clergy, political leaders, educators, and students for a nonpartisan, nonpolitical night of unity in support of Israel and the Jewish people around the world. Let me give you a history of how this night formed. Quickly after the terrorist attacks of October 7th, CCU condemned the violence and stood with Israel and her right to defend herself. We spoke out against the anti-Semitism on college campuses and called for all university leaders across America to support Israel. A friend of ours, Harold Smethels, where's Harold? Harold right here. Harold called and said, guys, I think it's great that you're doing that, but we need to do more. We do need to do more, and he's exactly right. There's always more that we can do. Tonight is designed to remember those who lost their lives in the terror attacks by Hamas, to fight for the return of those who are still being held hostage. You can see the pictures back there of all those that were taken in that terrorist attack and those that are still imprisoned as hostages. We want to stand against the growing anti-Semitism on college campuses. We want to educate our students in support of Israel. And we want to honor. Honor Israel, honor the Jews, honor our friends, and honor God. I am a Christian. I am not Jewish. I am a Zionist. I represent Christians all around the world in saying to our Jewish friends, you are not alone. We stand with you. The battle against Hamas and the growing anti-Semitism across America is a struggle between good and evil. The Jewish people are a light. Judaism is foundational to both Christianity and Western civilization, and tonight we honor you. Let's ask God to bless our dinner. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, we are so grateful for all of those joining us tonight. We ask for your blessings upon Israel. As it says in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord of God, I will seek your prosperity. Bless our meal, our conversation, those on the front lines of the battle against Hamas. Please return the hostages home soon. Bring peace to the Middle East, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, begin, uh, feel free to begin your dinner. While we are eating, we're going to have a series of speakers throughout the evening, but I am delighted to have with us tonight a concert pianist who has been described as one of America's major pianists. He is a Denver native, and he has not only performed around the world in major concert halls such as Carnegie, Carnegie Hall and Kennedy Center, but has given concert tours of Israel on four separate occasions. Even though he recently had major back surgery, he has volunteered to perform for us tonight, and I know that we will not only enjoy him, but find great meaning in his music. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Simon.
It's a pleasure and honor for me to be here this evening to play piano for you, and I know you're all having dinner, but I'd like to play two pieces for you. One is a by Franz Liszt, and it's called A Consolation, and it's meant to console for all those Israelis who have really suffered and felt loss. This is for them. And then I'd like to play a piece by a rather famous Israeli composer named Paul Ben Chaim, who immigrated to Israel in 1933 and from Germany, uh, and then lived in Israel and became an Israeli citizen, of course, after Israel had their independence in 1948. And he wrote uh, these. This piece, it's two pieces come together, and one is called a pastoral, and it sort of gives you a flavor of the Middle East and its mysticism. And then the second piece, he called it Takata, which is a very exciting piece, and it shows uh, the dynamic energy of Israel. So first I'm gonna play this consolation for all those Israelis who lost their lives and their families. And then this pastoral Takata by the Israeli composer Paul Ben Hayim.
So in order to not keep everybody out late, super late tonight, we're going to do speeches throughout the dinner so you get a chance to hear from Christian and Jewish leaders in our community. Friends, I'm proud to introduce the president of Colorado Christian University, Mr. Eric Hoag. Uh, president Hoag and I, in the planning of this, he said to me, Jeff, this is very important that we do need to do this for the scripture says to stand with Israel. That leadership that we have here at Colorado Christian University is what helps put on an evening like this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the president of Colorado Christian University, Eric Hope. Thanks, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, welcome to Colorado Christian University. It is great to have you on campus. And I have to say, the chancellor is over here to my right, Dr. Sweeting. On behalf of Dr. Sweeting and all of us here at CCU and myself and the president's office, I know that Larry Meisel could not make it tonight. And uh, by schedule and by health, he's been pulled away. So on behalf of Dr. Sweeting and the president's office, uh, we welcome you by live stream. We miss you, but we understand uh, exactly what you feel about the episodes that have transpired and your support of Colorado Christian University and your work here in Denver, Colorado. How about a round of applause for Larry and what he examples for all of us in this state. Thank you, Larry. Well, close to 15,000 Colorado Christian University students and distinguished faculty join me in welcoming you to this, to this conservative institution of higher learning, one that stands with the state of Israel and her right and her fight for liberty, justice, and defense of her homeland and her people, period, period. After October 7th's evil, heinous terrorist attacks upon Israel, I signed a full-page proclamation of support for Israel in the Wall Street Journal. I received several phone calls from many representatives of the Jewish community thereafter, ready to pick up a conversation. I recall one, Miriam from Queens, New York, thanking me and CCU for our joint statement in support of Israel. Through her tears on the phone that day in my office, just a couple of paces away, she said, and I quote, with all the things you must attend to as a president of a university, I must ask you, why do you care for Israel so much? End quote. To open tonight's dinner, let me extrapolate on that answer a bit. And the, the same answer that I gave Miriam, I'll embellish a little bit and give it to you, one that I find fitting for our time together this evening. The reason is summed up in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 5. And might I begin by reading the Holy Scripture. Go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, 1 through 5. This divine speech introduces a significant statement from the Almighty. It sets an agenda not only for Abram, but also for Abram's descendants focusing on how divine blessing will be mediated through Abram to all the families of the earth. It marks an important turning point in the book of Genesis. The almighty speech underscores the hope that through Abraham, people everywhere may experience almighty's favor and that divine plans for Abram and his descendants are national and international. Let me focus on the divine statement once again, a segment of it. I quote, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed, end quote. As it relates to the United States of America and Israel, it is obvious. The Almighty has specially blessed America because of her relationship with Israel, period. It's so obvious that even a tough-minded old kraut like uh, the Iron Chancellor Otto van Bismarck, who once said, the good Lord offers special protection to drunkards, to lost dogs, small children, and the United States of America, end quote. 
This theme is prominent in my good friend Michael Medved's book. Michael and I have been friends for a long time. He wrote a book about God's hand on America, divine providence in the modern era of this country. Michael devotes an entire chapter, The Abrahamic Advantage, to telling a story of how our American founders took the biblical sources very seriously that promised divine favor for a new nation that lived up to welcoming Jewish people. Medved tells the story of Christian restorationists who believed that America had a unique destiny to help Jewish people return to their homeland and rebuild Jerusalem, and I might even add, defend it today. Defend it today. With this current moment of surging anti-Semitism and Israel's endurance of the worst attack on her people since the Holocaust, I believe it is vitally important to open an occasional line of conversation that the brotherhood between Christians and Jews is strong and there is nothing that should ever separate it. So how about some evidence, Mr. President? How about some research? Little history. Let's go back in our country's time. John Adams to Thomas Jefferson. I quote, I will insist that Hebrews have done more to civilize man than any other nation on God's earth, end quote. Theodore Roosevelt, quote, there can be no peace worth having unless the Jews are given control of Palestine, end quote. Harry S. Truman, I had faith in Israel before it was established. I have faith in it now. It has a glorious future before it, not just another sovereign nation, but as an embodiment of great ideals of our civilization, end quote. John F. Kennedy, quote, let us make it clear that we will never turn our backs on our steadfast friends in Israel, whose adherence to the democratic way must be admired by all friends of freedom, end quote. Ronald Reagan, Quote, the people of Israel and America are historic partners in the global quest for human dignity and freedom. We will always, always remain at each other's side, end quote. My favorite president, George W. Bush. I like cowboys. I do like cowboys. Quote, through centuries of struggle, Jews across the world have been witnesses not only against the crimes of men, but for their faith in God and God alone. Theirs is a story of defiance and oppression and patience and tribulation, reaching back to the Exodus. That story continued in the founding of the State of Israel, and that story continues in the defense of the State of Israel today." End quote. Tonight, I stand before you publicly as the president of this university. As an American, as an evangelical, Christian, as a conservative, as a Christian educator, I promise you this university will continue to support Israel, her land, her state, and her people. You are home at CCU tonight. Home tonight. We stand with Israel because of our biblical brotherhood and the charge from the divine himself. Our journeys are rooted in a deep spiritual connection to the land and to a genuine belief in its vital role in God's plan for humanity. From the Board of Trustees, the executive leadership of Colorado Christian University, from the Chancellor's Office, from the President's Office, from our students, our distinguished faculty, all of our employees, all of our current students and alumni, Welcome to Colorado Christian University. We stand with you. We stand for your land. We stand for your liberty. We stand for your freedom. And we love you. May you have a great evening. Shalom. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for those inspiring words. Friends, our next speaker is the Chancellor of Colorado Christian University, a good friend of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Donald Sweeting.
Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight to this important gathering. And I, I particularly want to thank my friend Rabbi Hillel Goldberg for helping us pull this together. Uh, Rabbi Goldberg, where are you? Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, like many of you, I was stunned on October 7th and the days that followed, but I wasn't stunned by the attack. I've been to Israel six times. I've led groups with hundreds of Christians touring biblical sites in Israel. I know how fantastic yet how small that country is. We've all heard the threats from Iran wanting to wipe Israel off the map. And not long ago in Israel, I had the privilege of taking a tour of the Israel-Lebanese border, a tour given by IDF, and we walked into some of the tunnels that Hezbollah has dug into Israel to prepare for their next invasion. And looking over the border, we looked by binoculars and we saw the guard towers, the Hezbollah towers, that were built to resemble the towers in the Nazi concentration camps in Germany. And we saw the graffiti on the, on the post board saying a thousand jihadis are coming to Jerusalem. So I was not stunned by the attack. What stunned me this October was the celebrations taking place on American college campuses, uh, praising Hamas terrorists for their attempted genocide and treating them like a legitimate movement. What stunned me in October was the eruption of anti-Semitism around the world. What stunned me in October was the deafening silence from most of our university leaders. And when they finally did speak, they spoke with equivocation. And I thought, how is this happening in the 21st century in America and in our Western cities? And how is this happening only 78 years after World War II when the world said, never again? And how is it that so many universities have become anti-Semitism factories? Our gathering tonight is unusual. It's an unusual gathering in dark and strange times. The times are dark. And it's strange and horrifying to see our culture and Western culture shift and to see this bold, outright anti-Semitism at our elite universities and on our major city streets. And of course, sitting here together tonight is also somewhat unusual. You may think it's a little strange for a conservative evangelical school like Colorado Christian University to host an event like this. Let me offer you an explanation of what I think is happening. In the Western world and the United States, I believe we're observing a major cultural shift. The West is becoming post-Christian. With the ebbing of Christianity comes a decline in the basic appreciation and knowledge of Israel, its significance, and the importance of the Jewish people. In so many of our schools, we don't teach history anymore. That's especially true in our universities. We're losing our cultural memory, forgetting who we are, forgetting that what we fought for in World War II, and add to this a basic moral relativism that has been routinely taught in our universities for decades, the fruit of which Alan Bloom warned us about in the 1980s. And now we face the widespread embrace of an ideology in our universities, an updated version of Marxism, a kind of deconstructionist cultural Marxism in the academy, which our Jewish friend Yoram Hazoni uh, spoke to us about last year from this very platform. And to this, there's the growing presence of radical Islamist voices in America and the West, joining with American students, calling for the obliteration of the state of Israel. The alliance between the jihadists and the far left is very strange indeed. And what about the unusual occasion that brings us together tonight? Why would CCU, a Christian university, speak out so quickly, starting on October 8th, against the massacre by Hamas and speak up for Israel? its right to defend itself, its right to its ancestral lands? Why did we write national editorials and become one of the few universities to sign that statement with uh, Ari Berman and Yeshiva University that President Hogue just mentioned? I explain it this way. First, there's a moral reason. What Hamas did was evil. It very quickly became apparent to us that this was the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust. Watching the eruption of anti-Semitism in crowds around the world shouting gas the Jews was deeply disturbing to us. It became apparent to us that we're living in a dangerous time. And what Hamas did to Palestinian people and Palestinian Christians, using them as shields and pawns was also evil. Second, there's an academic reason. 
We do teach history at Colorado Christian University. We require every undergraduate student in our residential program to take a class in Western civilization, American history, and American politics, not to mention Bible history. We also teach about the Holocaust and much more. We cannot forget. And then there's what I call a covenantal reason, because we are Bible people. And our Bible tells us that the Jews were called to be God's chosen people. We acknowledge God's unique covenant with Israel in the past and the special place of the Jews in God's plan of redemption. They have been a light to the Gentile world. And in some mysterious yet important way, we believe that God is still at work in its history. And along with that, we believe that we have a debt to the Jews that we have not sufficiently acknowledged as Christians this debt over the centuries, and I think a great deal of the misguided anti-Semitism of Christians could have been averted had we acknowledged our debt. We've forgotten the Jewish roots of our faith. Most of our Bible is the Hebrew scriptures. Without the Jews, we would have no Old Testament, which is what we call it, which is essential to understand our New Testament. It, the Jewish scriptures introduce us to the themes of creation, fall, redemption, atonement, the promise of a new heaven and earth. Through the Jews, God gave the law of Moses to the world, the Ten Commandments, the Great Commandment, the idea of covenant. We share the same hymn book, the Psalms. We draw on the same wisdom literature. Without the Jews, we would have no church, no Mary, no Joseph, no Jesus. The gospel that we love is deeply informed by all these things. This is not to deny the differences that we have and the tensions we may feel tonight, but we love Israel and see it not only as America's best ally, but as the protectorate of most of the world's Jews and an outpost of Western civilization in the Middle East. By the way, we have a club for Israel on campus. We send students to Israel every year to do archeological digs. Jeff Hunt and I joined Larry Mizell this past April for the opening of his new museum in Jerusalem and the celebration of Israel's 75th anniversary. And I wouldn't be honest if I didn't tell you that I have a personal reason for taking this stand. In 1944, during World War II, my uncle helped liberate a concentration camp in Austria. He served with the 71st Infantry Division of the Army and was one of the first in his division to stumble across Gunkirchen Lager, the central Nazi concentration camp in Austria, which held 15,000 Hungarian Jews. When he told my family his stories and what he saw and what he experienced, it left a deep impression on my mind and heart and shapes the way I look at contemporary events. And it reminds me that we have faced dark and unusual times in the past, and in the end, darkness does not prevail. And as believers in the God of the scriptures, we say with the psalmist, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Friends, we want you to know that at CCU, as has been said, we do stand with you. We represent many other Christians all around the country who do as well, and we want to be a blessing to you in this dark time. That is our desire. We will work to that end. That's what tonight is for, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Chancellor Sweeting. Friends, after the attacks uh, took place, I attended a local community gathering that was led by the Anti-Defamation League here in Colorado. And it was um, powerful to see the service that they provide to the community. Our next speaker is Scott Levin, who serves as the Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League Mountain States. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Scott Levin.
Thank you so much, Jeff, for inviting us here. And of course, to President Hogue and Dr. Sweeting, your, your words mean so much to us. And to all of you, the fact that you would come out on this night to be here for Israel and in support of the Jewish community is deeply, deeply felt. Just really quickly want to acknowledge a couple people in the room that I'd like you to meet. The chair of our board, Susan Brody, who's over here. And my good friend and colleague, Renee Rockford, who is the president and CEO of Jewish Colorado, our federation. <laughs> Friends, for over 110 years, it's been the mission of the Anti-Defamation League to not only fight anti-Semitism, but also to secure justice and fair treatment to all. You see, it's a belief that our founders had that as a minority population, believe it or not, never more than 3% of this country, we need allies in order to be safe and to be secure. And in order to have allies, you have to be an ally. But I would argue that even more so, this dual mission recognizes values that I know are shared by all of you in this room as well, Jews and non-Jews. The values that I refer to are encapsulated in the three important questions attributed to one of the greatest Jewish sages of all time, Hillel. In a compilation of advice, of ethics and wisdom that we call the Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our fathers, which was first written down around 200, Hillel asked, first of all, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Hillel recognized the importance of standing up and advocating for yourself. He next asked, but if I'm only for myself, what am I? In other words, he noted the importance of standing up not only for yourself, but also to speak out on behalf of others. And that, after all, is what you are doing by being here tonight. You've recognized the importance of standing up for Israel and for the Jewish people, and for that we are thankful. The third question that Hillel asked, which I think is equally important, is if not now, when? When you are compelled to act for yourself and for others, you should never wait to do so. And boy, that describes the action of this wonderful community. Colorado Christian University did not wait to hear about the tremendous need that, that the Jewish community or that Israel had. It took immediate action in signing off on that statement, in organizing events like this one here tonight. It recognized what I like to refer as Martin Luther King's statement a couple thousand years after Hillel when he said, the urgency of now. Today we ask everyone to recognize the urgency of now as we fight for the existence of Israel and we're faced with anti-Semitism at levels not seen in this country for decades. You know those brutal and horrific acts that took place on October 7th. They have shaken the Jewish community to its core as it should all moral and ethical people. The ceasefire that was in effect on October the 6th was broken by Hamas, a terrorist organization so recognized by the United States, the European Union, and any thinking person. This is an organization that not only embeds terrorists in their weapons upon a, uh, among a civilian population, but it also takes money provided by the world for humanitarian causes and purposes, and instead uses them to construct infrastructure. And you, instead of constructing the infrastructure and utilities that are needed by the Palestinian people, it uses them to enrich their leaders and build a spider web of reinforced tunnels to hide the terrorists and the weapons beneath homes and hospitals, schools, and mosques. Imagine that. And while we are glad that those hostages that were released last week are back at home as terrible and traumatic of a thing as they have gone through, 
we know that there are still almost 140 more that are still held in captivity. The IDF has certainly put Hamas on its heels, but it's not eradicated the scourge and the threat of a promised repeat of the beheadings, rapes, burnings, torture, murders, all that occurred on October 7th and in its aftermath. And while there's much focus today on the rockets Israel has fired in an effort to destroy the terror tunnels, it's important to note the rockets indiscriminately fired by Hamas continue to rain down upon Israel every day. So when people call for this ceasefire by Israel at a time when there are still hostages being held, when Hamas still has the capability to do harm to Israel in such a terrible and brutal way, it is simply ridiculous. No one even attempts to discuss the terms of such a ceasefire. I ask by whom, on what terms, what guarantee of safety does Israel have? Believe me, Israel knows that no one can guarantee its safety but Israel. And that can only happen with the removal of Hamas. For Jews, having witnessed how far Hamas and its followers made it into Israel, and the terribly inhumane actions that they took, in spite of what's probably one of the greatest fighting forces and most intelligent forces on earth, it's made most of us feel a bit adrift. Combined with the anti-Semitism that we're seeing in this country and around the world, there's really a downright feeling of vulnerability. And some people might question how Jewish people in this country can be the targets of such Jew hatred. After all, despite the fact that my grandfather came here without the proverbial two nickels to rub together as a poor immigrant, I and many of my co-religionists have been blessed by a country that has given us a measure of influence and for some of us the privilege of affluence. People don't understand how a 2,000 year history of anti anti-Semitism affects us and how today we're even still here. Anti-Semitic incidents have been at historic levels. For the past 10 years, they've been a large increase that we've witnessed at the ADL. And since October 7th, it's been astronomical. We estimate across the country there's been an increase of over 300%. And I can tell you that in my office, the ADL region that covers Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming, we are seeing 10 to 15 incidents a day that people are contacting us in need of support. These are happening, as was mentioned, on schools and campuses across the region. There's protests, there's rallies, there's the hijacking of legislative proceedings in our state legislature and in our municipal city council meetings. In America and around the world today, there are far too many people that trust the oppressed over the oppressor. And they don't even know what that means. And when it comes to Israel, there's this mistaken belief that this tiny country, no bigger than the state of New Jersey, surrounded by 22 Muslim countries, many of which, like Hamas, call for the absolute destruction of the Jewish state. Somehow, they believe that Israel is the oppressor, and what's so upside down about this is the terrorist organization, Hamas, and the people it leads are the oppressed. It makes no sense. Equally upside down is the belief that Israel is this white colonial enterprise which today is the worst thing that we can face, according to some. But they don't understand who Israel is, and I just want to share with you so you know, I don't look like the majority of people in Israel. My, my grand, great-grandparents, they were the descendants of people that ended up in Eastern Europe when the diaspora came. I might present as a white person in America, the majority of people in Israel are Mizrahi Jews, whose people, when the diaspora occurred, ended up going into the Middle East and North Africa, into Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Iran, 
Persia, before they were, even had those names that existed, that were there. Many of you have been to Israel and you know that the Israelis, it's hard to tell who would be a, a Muslim and who would be a Jew because they're every bit as Arabic in their appearance that's there. But in America, because I look like a white person, therefore I must be part of this oppressor, I must be part of this white colonist. And to be a colonialist also makes absolutely no sense. To be a colony, you have to be a colony of a motherland. Where is it that the Jews of Israel report back to as their motherland? It doesn't exist. Again, all of this is a fallacy. But I do have another ask for you before I end tonight, and that's to understand the words matter. And I know you get that, you're here tonight, but I hope you'll share with your friends. There's a couple of words that are out there and phrases that are absolutely anti-Semitic in what they are saying, and people don't always know. One of those is the word genocide. It's being applied as if Israel is creating a genocide to people who have suffered the worst genocide in history through the Holocaust. You know as well as I do that genocide has meaning, just like ethnic cleansing does. This is an intentional attempt to try to destroy, eradicate, kill a group of people because of their religion, their ethnicity, their nationality, and the like. But that is not true, it can't be true. We know that in 1948, when Israel was formed, there were a couple of hundred thousand Palestinians that are today five million Palestinians. It is not a genocide. It is certainly not ethnic cleansing. And please, please understand when people are out there chanting free Palestine, what they mean. And if they don't know, it's up to us to tell them. That's short for free Palestine from the river to the sea. What river, what sea? The Jordan River on the west and the Mediterranean Sea on the east. If you are freeing that land, you are doing away with the Jewish state of Israel, just like Hamas called for in its initial charter. That is not acceptable. It was anti-Semitic on October the 6th, and it was anti-Semitic today. So you know, as well as I do, that these words matter. And I thank you so much as a community. We honestly don't always align on every issue that goes on. I'm so glad when I got to be with Jeff Hunt uh, together. We're not always there. I have to admit that to you. But the fact that you're willing to stand up for yourselves on those issues that are important to you and that you're willing to stand up for Israel and for the Jewish people, it means something. And the fact that you're using that urgency of now to come together tonight to be in support makes us feel proud to be your friend and so thankful to be with you. Thank you very much. Scott Levin, Anti-Defamation League, thank you so very much. Friends, when we asked our Jewish friends who we should have speak, they kept saying the same name, Hezi Shalev, needs to be a part of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker. He's a member of the Israeli American Council, Hezi Shalev. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, Jeff, for inviting me. Thanks, uh, CCU. And thank all of you. Uh, as an Israeli, um, I cannot tell you how heartwarming it is to see uh, this support. In my remarks today, three short personal stories of life and death and one eternal question. My grandfather was sent to Auschwitz when he was 22. After losing most members of his immediate and broad family. He came to mandatory Palestine, fought for the establishment of the Jewish state, and fought in Israel's war, war of independence, forced upon us by the Arabs who rejected their portion of the land, not for the first time. 
unfortunately molded by fierce anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, the atrocities of the Nazis, 11 months in the Jordanian prison. Despite it all, my grandfather had one message to me throughout his entire life. The ultimate revenge, he always told me, is life. Free, peaceful, dignified life. That is what they have always wanted to take from us, and that is what we have never and will never give them. The Jews, arguably the most persecuted people in the history of mankind, have always refused being the victim. Through sheer resilience, we stuck to our deep beliefs and to our core values and marched on. This is the Jewish version of revenge, life above all. On March 27, 2002, in the Park Hotel in Netanya, a city in Israel, a few families gathered for one of the most important family and religious days in the Jewish calendar, the Passover Seder. Dressed as a woman, a suicide bomber entered the room, blew himself up, murdering 30 members of one family and injuring 160 more. One of the survivors, a year behind me in law school, lost all of her family but her brother. Israel announced Operation Defensive Shield, and I was recruited as a reservist back from law school. A few days into the operation, I found myself in the hospital. I wasn't shot. I wasn't even injured. In the battles in and around the terrorist nest city of Jenin, our forces were shot at, fired back, and hit the Hamas terrorist. I was sent by my commander in a military ambulance with a wounded Hamas terrorist rushing him to an Israeli hospital for an emergency operation to save his life. I spent the night guarding him at the hospital. We exchanged some stories in my broken Arabic and his broken Hebrew. I've gone back in my memory multiple times to that incident, thinking to myself, what would have happened had it been the other way around? Would they have rushed me to a hospital to save my life? Would they have treated me with the dignity and respect I treated the terrorist that had just beforehand tried to kill us? Or would they have brutally dismembered my body and celebrated my death? I think we all know the answers to those questions. That difference, I believe, says it all. One people protecting life, any life, above all and through it all. Another actively to take life and celebrate death. On October 7th, I put a big Israeli flag outside of our house in Colorado. A few days ago, just a few days ago, my son, my youngest, nine years old, came to me and asked me to take down the flag. He said he was scared. He said that he's scared that someone would see the flag and try to break into our house and harm us because we're Jewish. We live in a, at, the at the end of a dead end street in a suburb of Denver, in the United States of America, in 2023, and my son is scared that someone is going to break into our house and hurt us because we're Jewish. I told him what I told him, something appropriate to his age, but then I thought more about that. It's not just the Israeli flag. They're taking down the Australian flag under the Sydney Opera House, the British flag in the streets of London, indeed the US flag on Lexington Avenue in New York City. You think they're coming for the Jews? It wasn't an Israeli-Arab conflict behind the 2011 Mumbai bombing by the Indian Mujahideen. It isn't the Jewish-Muslim conflict behind the 2000, uh, sorry, it isn't the Jewish-Muslim dispute behind the mass rapes of non-Muslims by Boko Haram in Nigeria. It wasn't a territorial question behind the Paris attacks in 2015, killing 137 French. Indeed, none of these was the question behind 9-11 murdering 3,000 Americans. The jihadists are coming for you. They're coming for all of us. They're coming for our shared values of dignity, life, respect, and freedom. Whether you understand it or not, we all now live in Israel. And unless we call jihad for what it is and deal with it as a shared, imminent, common danger to our Western Judeo-Christian civilization, it is not just the Israeli flag that I will have to remove from my front lawn in Colorado. In closing, a question. What was the first question in the Bible? Before the world was created, there were no questions. 
what was the first question in the Bible? Adam and Eve had just eaten from the forbidden fruit. And God then asks Adam the very first question in the Bible. In Hebrew, it's a single word, Ayeka, where are you? Does God not know where Adam is? Of course he does. Adam knows that and indeed does not answer, here I am. Instead, he says, I was afraid and therefore hid. In other words, Adam understands that God's question is not one of physical location. It's one of spiritual location. And that question, the first question, is also our eternal question. Where are you spiritually? Where are you morally? Can you elevate yourself above one-line tweets, slogans, and ignorance, and into the actual meaning? Can you tell the difference between good and evil? So in closing, I ask you, keep asking yourselves this eternal question of morality. Keep reminding yourself of who truly shares your core values. Keep asking yourself if this is the America, if this is the world you want to live in. And keep fighting those who wish for death by supporting, now and forever, those who fight above all and through it all for life. Thank you. Hezzy, thank you so much. Do not miss the standing ovation for your speech. <laughs> Friends, while we may be hosting our very first, and I hope annual, CCU for Israel dinner, CCU has been active uh, with archaeological digs with students in the Middle East for quite some time. To tell us more about that is our Associate Professor of Old Testament Studies and Biblical Archaeology and the leader of our CCU archaeological digs in Israel, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Seth Rodriguez. Good evening. My name is Seth Rodriguez. I am the Associate Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Archaeology here at Colorado Christian University. I'm proud to stand before you tonight as a friend of Israel and of Jews everywhere. I'm a Christian and I love Israel. For the past, uh, as, as an expression of our friendship, I would like to share with you the various ways that CCU students and faculty uh, have supported Israel and contributed to the work of Israeli scholars and universities. For the past several years, when we were not in the middle of a pandemic, the School of Theology and the College of Undergraduate Studies has brought a team of CCU students to Israel. We visit archeological sites around the country, traveling from Dan to Beersheba, but mostly we spend our time volunteering on an excavation for three weeks. These trips were started by Dr. David Cotter, uh, Dean of the School of Theology. We're co-led by Dr. Cotter and myself for a few years, uh, and now I have the immense privilege of uh, leading these trips to, uh, to Israel every year. Uh, a few students and faculty and faculty wives are here this evening who have participated in those, uh, on the, in those excavations. If you are a student who has traveled to Israel with us or a faculty or wife, uh, I'd invite you to stand so uh, people can, or if you're, coming to Israel this coming year. From 2016 to 2019, CCU brought four teams, uh, each one about 15 to 18 people uh, strong, to partner with Dr. Aaron Mayer from Bar Ilan University as he conducted excavations at the site of Tel Asafi, which is biblical Gath, the hometown of Goliath. Uh, was not very hard to convince students to come dig at Goliath's hometown. Uh, the, uh, the CCU students helped uncover what's called the Watergate there um, in, in the lower city in 2018. Uh, and then we excavated the foundations of the city wall in 2019 that date to the time of David and Goliath. Uh, based on the pottery we found, constructing the city wall dates to 11th century BC. And so uh, on top of this foundation would have been the city wall that David would have seen as he walked, uh, or sorry, that Goliath would have seen as he walked up the valley uh, to go meet David. Uh, this um, was such a significant find that it made headlines in the Times of Israel, the Jerusalem Post, and other news outlets. Uh, after the 2019 season, Dr. Mayer 
again at Barlon University, sent me the following statement about our contribution to his excavation. Quote, I cannot but stress the significant and substantial contribution of the CCU team for the excavations at Talasafi Gath. To start with, the CCU staff and students are exemplary in their hard work, great spirits, and overall contribution to the excavation project in general and to the areas in which they work. The work ethic, good spirits, and professionalism stands out every year again and again. Finally, let me state that both David and Seth set a gold standard in their leadership of the CCU team, who along with the students serve as an outstanding example of hard work, good values, and camaraderie, which is highly influential on other team members and groups at the excavation. I can safely say that after 23 years of excavations at the site, the CCU team stands out as perhaps the highest quality team that we have ever had. <clears throat> End quote, and after I stopped blushing, <laughs> I sent him a thank you email. <laughs> I, I didn't expect that. Uh, so I'm, I'm humbled by the praise. Uh, Air My Ear is one of the leading archeologists in Israel uh, currently. In 2020, we had a team of students ready to go, but the, then the pandemic hit, so like everyone else, we had to cancel those plans. But we returned to Israel as soon as, we, as, soon as possible in 2022, where we dug at, uh, we brought a team of 15 students and staff members to dig at Tel Shiloh, where the tabernacle stood for 300 years. And we were back in the field this last summer with a team of 17 people. Uh, digging with Dr. Itzhak Shai from Ariel University at the site of Tel Berna, uh, with the biblical site of Libna. The CCU team helped in all five excavation areas, which were active this summer, helping Dr. Shai and his team better understand the history of this biblical site. And we currently have a team of 17 people, students and staff, uh, lined up to go to Israel this coming summer. And we will see, uh, we are, uh, that is still our plan A. We are holding those plans loosely. We're hoping to get back to uh, Israel uh, even this coming summer. <clears throat> So in summary, uh, over the last eight years, CCU has taken dozens of students to Israel, uh, and with our recently launched minor in biblical archaeology, we are committed to do so. Furthermore, we're committed to pursuing partnerships with educational institutions in Israel. CCU is currently strengthening its ties with REL University, uh, hoping eventually to send some of our archaeology students to, per, uh, to pursue graduate work there. Dr. Uh, Itzhak Shai recently wrote, me, wrote to me to confirm that REL University will acknowledge credits for coursework that our students have completed here at CCU as they pursue uh, degrees there at REL University. Uh, and also to tell me that CCU has been recognized by the Israeli Council for Higher Education. So we look forward to developing this partnership over the next several years. To conclude, CCU is a friend of Israel. We have been deeply saddened by the horrendous evil attack uh, against Israel by the hands of Hamas, knowing that this tragedy has affected personal friends that we know that we've excavated with there. Um, people that we've known to grow, we've grown to know and love over the last several years. We stand with you as we pray for peace to settle on the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we stand, um, uh, we remain committed to locking arms uh, with Jews, with Israeli universities as we continue archaeological work in the land of Israel. And as King David wrote in Psalm 122, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you. Friends, we had uh, students here at CCU that were um, impacted by the terrorist attacks because they're from Israel. And we asked them to make a few remarks as they have family members that are serving these days uh, in the defense of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CCU students Annie and Liel Salinger. Shalom Kulam. My name is Liel Salinger, and I am a senior here at CCU. And I'm Annie Salinger, and I'm a junior here at CCU. Um, so me and Liel both have had the privilege of being born and raised in Haifa, Israel, where um, we moved in 2013 to Washington State, where we've been there for 10 years now. Our dad is a Jewish Israeli, and he met my mom in Israel, who my mom is actually an American who grew up in Boulder, Colorado. 
Yeah. It's good. Um, they, so when they met in Israel, they raised us and three other siblings. So we're five kids in total. And in Haifa. And our entire extended family on my dad's side is still in Israel. Um, they are spread out throughout Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Haifa. It has been such a blessing for both of us to be able to study at a university that has a love and understanding of the God of Israel and the Bible. The recent events of October 7th have only solidified CCU's love and support of Israel. With all of our family still in Israel, the war has been very heavy on our hearts, our hearts occupying our thoughts day and night. Many of our family members and friends are serving on the front lines, sorry, <laughs> are serving on the front lines in the current war. Our cousins, Eitan and Ariel, have been called up with the reservists in the IDF, and our uncle is a high-ranking Air Force pilot. They have not been home with their families in these last two months. They have wives at home who are serving our country in the same way as they serve their homes and their children. Sorry. <laughs> um, so with much information, um, misinformation around us throughout the media and the news, um, we are so grateful for CCU who know and stand for the truth and support Israel wholeheartedly. We could not have gone through these difficult days without the love, the support, and understanding of CCU its staff, from its staff, and all the students. I know we have all been shocked to see the rising anti-Semitism around the world. Israel needs now more than ever for her true friends to speak up and stand with her in support. We are so grateful for the opportunity to speak up for Israel and against anti-Semitism. <laughs> um, well, growing up, um, we loved our childhood in Israel. And there is so much rich culture, and it's so colorful there too as well within the culture and life there, and we miss it so much. But one of my favorite memories is celebrating so many of the Jewish holidays all year long. And as many of you know, the celebration of Hanukkah is just two days from now. I remember as a little girl that during Hanukkah, we would light the menorah, um, and also, along with that, Chanukiah, sorry. <laughs> and also, along with that, we would, at school, I would exchange a lot of candy with kids, and I'd gained a lot of candy out of it, too. <laughs> it was a good memory. Um, but it's so beautiful to see how Chanukah is such a beautiful celebration of light, especially during this time right now. Um, so my sister and I have been able to enjoy the vast beauty of the country of Israel and spent almost all of our childhood outside, camping by the Kineret, running by the Mediterranean, snorkeling in the Red Sea, and camping in the Negev. Um, the Negev is one of my favorite places in Israel, and um, we both have such fond memories of um, camping there and um, being under the stars. I have hiked many mountains in beautiful Colorado and the state of Washington, um, but I've never seen stars so close as I did there. And it's such a blessing to know um, that the one who made the stars is near to the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. We would like to personally thank each of you for standing with us for Israel and thank CCU for hosting such a wonderful event that allows us to come together in support and pray for peace in Israel. Thank you so much. Such lovely ladies, um, thank you for representing your country so well this evening and for representing CCU. Friends, while other universities have had uh, protests, those types of things, we haven't had that here at Colorado Christian University, and that is in part due to the leadership of the student body. Our next speaker is the president of the student body here at Colorado Christian University. Please welcome Nathan Schlager. to raise that up. Okay, well, thank you for that warm introduction, Mr. Hunt. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of all of us students here at CCU. 
Thank you as student body president for this opportunity. Thank you for this, this information and this deeper understanding of what's actually happening. The news doesn't say it right. And so it's good to know that people here actually know what's going on in this war. And after complying all these amazing speeches together, I've come up with what I want to encourage the students today. The word I choose is action. As a student, how do we take action? Well, first steps is by speech. If you look at Exodus 34, 6 through 7, it says, The Lord, the Lord, abundant and merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abundant and steadfast love, love, steadfast love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sins. And I hear that verse, and the first thing that comes to mind is first, the goodness of our God, and an action step. What can we do? Well, as students, we can stop anti-Semitism. Anti -Semitism. We can stand up by ways we speak. We can be gracious. We can be merciful. We can be slow to anger. And we can be abundant in love. That's what we can do. So let's stand up for what's good. Let's stand up for what's right. Let's stand up for Israel. Because that's what God calls us to do. And that's what he told Moses to do. And second, by listening. Proverbs 5, 1 says this, A wise man will know and hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. And to be honest, this is a group of wise counsel. This is a group of people who support what's right. This is a group of people that is going to stand for you. This is a group of people that love, who are merciful, who are gracious, who are slow to anger. This is a group of people who are willing to listen. And I love that. And I want us to take action. I want us to be able to speak what's right. And I want us to be able to listen to see what's actually going on. This war, this murder, this terrorism, it needs to stop now. And as students here at CCU, that's what we can do. And I want to encourage every student, staff, faculty, and honorable guests here today to stand up for what's right, to stand up for what God calls us to stand up for, and that's Israel. And so as your student body president, and now hopefully your guys' friend, that's what I stand up for. And that's what I will be encouraging every student here at CCU to stand up for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate, for your encouragement to our students. Uh, since the terrorist attacks, I've spent just about every day on the phone uh, with Jewish leaders. And um, Rich Sokol, where's Rich? Right here. Rich Sokol back there. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of your personal life. You have some fans here, for sure. You have a lot more. Uh, Rich dropped what he was doing and went to Israel and was calling me via WhatsApp. I didn't even have WhatsApp until a month ago, um, but I guess that's how we communicate. And um, I wanted to have a connection to somebody that was from Denver, directly affected by the terrorist attacks. And he introduced me to some wonderful people. I got to spend some time interviewing Roxanne Dan. And I want you to watch and hear her story as a mother and as a grandmother what she went through on that day. Let's go ahead and play that video, please. Uh, well, I was born in Denver at Rose Hospital. I went uh, through high school in Denver. We were awakened on, Sunday, on Saturday morning with explosions, with what's called in Hebrew, boomim, you know, the explosions of rockets overhead before any sirens. So you just rush out of bed and rush into the house and into the room, each house, um, in this region has its own in internal room, which is also the kid's bedroom. And it has a heavy steel window, extra concrete a reinforced room, and, and a steel door. We run to the sealed room. We were locked in this room from 6.30 in the morning until 1 a.m. until we, we were escorted out by military escort to get us out of the kibbutz. Um, we went into the room thinking, usually you're in the room for 20 minutes, and then you go out and continue with your day. We didn't have, we had one quart of water, 
and the banana for the four-year-old. Oh, I didn't mention, so we're staying with our son and his wife, and they have two sons. Uh, Noam is four, and Elam is one. So we were all six of us locked in this one room uh, all day with just that amount of food. Um, and we're listening to a little bit of what's going on. At first, we don't hear much from the grounds. And there was a time in the morning at about maybe 7.38 when my son told us that a man from their kibbutz, who is also the uh, mayor of their region, uh, was killed on his way to the armory. What happens is every community has a local civil defense uh, that people on alert, they, they don't keep their guns at home. It's in an armory, so you get that, and you go to the gate to defend yourself. But by the time he got there, it was already, these people had invaded the kibbutz, and he was killed right off in the morning. Our experience was hearing live gunfire all day, not knowing who's shooting at whom. We didn't know how many terrorists were in the kibbutz. Um, at some point, the shooting got closer. So our son from the group, WhatsApp group knew that it was um, a neighbor's house, um, that, they, that the terrorists had actually gotten into the house and their family was in their sealed room, a sealed room or a, a shelter room. A husband, wife, a young baby, and the mother was eight months pregnant. So before you ask, they're okay. They made it out okay, but it was spending all day not knowing what's going on. It's like being blind in a movie theater at an action movie, and you don't know what's going on. At a certain point, our son, Hanan, eh, suddenly got up and grabbed a piece of wood, a, a shelf out of one of their cupboards, and jimmied it against the door handle so you couldn't open the door handle from outside. And we had no idea why. Afterwards, when you hear the stories of other places like theirs or other families, it's to keep the terrorists from coming into the houses and knowing people are inside these rooms, we're opening the rooms, these sealed steel doors, but it was just held by a handle. People spent hours holding this metal handle so the apps couldn't be opened from the outside. At about 10 o'clock at night, there was somebody entered the house for the first time. It was our Israeli army soldiers. And there was negotiation between the steel door. The soldiers are asking who's inside. Turns out their question, they wanted to know if it was only our family or if there were terrorists inside holding us hostage, ready to ambush soldiers who came to rescue them because they had done that at other houses. On our side, my son and daughter-in-law wanted to make sure that these are Israeli soldiers and not terrorists who spoke Hebrew because they had lived in Israel or had worked in Israel before. So it took some negotiations and who's you know asking questions. They opened the door. They saw we were fine. There were a bunch of soldiers out there, as heavily suited up as you can imagine. And they said, no, you're staying here. We just want to make sure you're okay. Stay indoors with the sealed door still locked. And we will put soldiers on the outside. But stay locked inside until we come to get you in about three hours. At about um a quarter to one they came back and they gave a code word when they were there the first time they gave a code word so they didn't have to go through a rigmarole again of who's at the door they came back so okay get ready you have 10 minutes to pack up and get ready to leave and um so then the, we, we went out onto the street on the street there were a lot of soldiers with open um, military type vehicles and we were driven from this neighborhood to the main intersection outside the kibbutz where there were two buses waiting for people. And, and this whole thing has affected um, everybody in the, in the country, I think. Either you're, you're, either you're evacuated or you're hosting evacuees or you're volunteering or your children who are in regular army service or children or husbands and brothers who are already way out of the army but are in reserves are called up. Um, Everybody's got something connected. I saw in my own eyes a woman who was pregnant, four months pregnant. She was in a little village, a little kibbutz. They came into her house in front of her kids. They opened up her stomach, took out the baby and stabbed the little tiny baby in front of her and then shot her in front of her family. I saw little kids who were beheaded. We didn't know which head belongs to which kid. 
I was crying for five days straight. I couldn't get out. Of, I couldn't stop crying. See, little children, some of them had grandparents who were Holocaust survivors and they were murdered in a Holocaust in Israel in 2023. Little babies, little children, you couldn't even recognize if they were kids. They couldn't, we couldn't even recognize we saw a little baby in an oven. They put them in, these bastards put these babies in an oven and put on their oven. Aviv. From personal stories of people we know in this state to horrific stories that we'll never forget. I want to make this very clear to those watching. We will not stop until all the hostages are brought home. Some of those uh, children were brought home. Uh, the 10 month old is still out there. You can see his poster. It's right back there. Uh, when Don Sweden and I started putting this together, um, we're not experts. <laughs> and we called upon a friend. And he's been one of the greatest friends that Colorado Christian University could ask for. When I got to tour the Intermountain Jewish News, I saw a picture of his dad standing with Billy Graham. And Rabbi Hillel Goldberg has continued that legacy of building bridges between evangelicals and Jews. I'm so very grateful for you, friend. He's the editor and publisher of the Intermountain Jewish News. It's out there. You should pick up a copy. He's been kind enough to offer, and we'll send around an email to you all, a discount to be able to get a subscription so we can continue to build these bridges. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, our good friend, Rabbi Hillel Goldberg. I was in Israel on October 7th. By the end of the day, I was told that 300 people had been murdered, including entire families that had been wiped out. By the next day, I knew more. The numbers had gone up. And the details had come in. Little babies kidnapped, people beheaded, adults kidnapped, murders, rapes. I was then speechless, and I remain speechless. I received a, a news brief in the office yesterday. It was about roughly half of the United States Senate 
that had been shown videos of October 7th. And when they left, journalists wanted to know what they thought. Well, here's what Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, a Democrat, said. I don't want to talk about it. She said as she walked away, her eyes filled with tears. I apologize, I do not remember the name of the senator from Tennessee. She couldn't even say that. She was so distressed and broken up, waved her hand at the journalist and kept walking. I'm speechless. People say to me, how are you? I don't know how to answer that anymore. Where is there room for faith when a person is speechless? Where is the place for faith when one has no words? Permit me to speak about two words. One, place and two, wing. Place. We know the narrative, the story of Abraham as he argued with God about the impending destruction of the sinful cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, Hashofet kola oretz lo mishpat, the judge of the entire world will not do justice. Maybe there's 50 righteous people in the city. Will you destroy the city along with 50 righteous people? God says no. But Abraham can't find 50 righteous people. So he says 45. Can't find 45 righteous people. And he keeps going. You know the story. Maybe there's 40 righteous people, but there aren't. Maybe there's 30. Maybe there's 20. Maybe there's 10. And it turns out there are not 10. And when the narrative is finished in the Torah, it says, Vashov Avram Limakomo. Abraham returned to his place. Which place was that? Well, one commentator says it was Hebron. Another one says somewhere else. Rashi, the famous biblical commentator, the most famous commentator in Jewish history, he says something else. He says, once the defender falls silent, the judge leaves the courtroom. Okay, this metaphor, the defender is Abraham. The judge is God. And if you read the narrative after it says Abraham returned to his place, it indeed describes the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham had fallen silent. So the judge, God, dismissed court and proceeded to destroy the city. What might we deduce from this? I think we can deduce the following. What if Abraham had not left the court? He had nothing more to say. He had no arguments. He'd run out of arguments. He was left speechless. But the clear implication is, had he remained there, even silent, had he stayed at his post, God would not have proceeded to implement the strict divine justice. So I think the message is, when we're speechless, we're left without words, and how can any decent human being know what happened, let alone see pictures thereof on October 7th, be anything but speechless? But if we remain at our place, 
even if we cannot formulate the words, the court is not dismissed. If we remain firm in our faith, even if we cannot explain and cannot formulate, the strict divine decree is not implemented. One word about wing. The story is told in the Talmud about a man named Elisha, who was nicknamed Elisha Balkanafai. Elisha, the master of the wings, or Elisha, the winged one. And he lived in the time of the Roman persecutions. And the Romans decreed that any Jew who was wearing tefillin, the phylacteries, the leather boxes that contain holy script that one prays with in the morning, on the weekdays, this person will have his eyes gouged out. You know, sometimes we read these things and uh, it's a tale, it's a metaphor, it's a story, whatever. But you know what? After October 7th, I read something and it says, his eyes are going to be gouged out. This is evil. We've seen evil. But he's a faithful Jew, so he's not going to bend to the decree. So he wears his tefillin. And sure enough, he's spotted by a Roman officer, starts to chase him, but he's going to kill him. And he runs, and he runs, but they catch up with him. And just before the Roman officer catches up with him, he takes it to fill him off his head and he puts it in his, in his fist. And of course, the Roman officer says, what do you have there in the fist? And he opens his fist and out flies a dove. A dove. This story is told in the Talmud and on the typical Talmud page, there is these long, dense commentaries by Tosafot, on this particular story, there's a, a one-line commentary, one little line. And it asks a simple question. OK, there was a dove. Why a dove? Because a dove's wings protect it. And so likewise, if Jews observe the Torah, they'll be protected. But Tosfus answers a simple question. Any one of you here could ask the question, why a dove? Every bird has wings. Every bird's wings protect. So Tosfa says in the name of Midrash, he says like this, he answers. A dove is different when a dove is wounded. When a dove is hurt, it doesn't rest. It doesn't alight somewhere. It keeps flying with one wing. It doesn't stop. That's the Jewish people today. That's people of goodwill, like everyone in this room today. That's Dr. Sweeting. That's Jeff Hunt. That's my new friends and my old friends. And that's the state of Israel. It is wounded. It is terribly wounded. All those who were killed, all the families, all the hostages, all the soldiers, but even more than all of that. The entire, the entire country has been changed. It'll take decades to get beyond this. But we don't stop flying. We fly with one wing. If that's all we got, we don't alight. We do not rest. So even though we may not know what to say, we may be speechless, we know what to do. We know what to do. And you're all doing it tonight. And God willing, we will keep doing all the things that we need to do. Because if we have to fly with one wing, we will. Rabbi Hillel Goldberg of the Intermountain Jewish News. We're going to pivot now towards action, towards making a difference. As uh, we prepared for tonight, I was introduced 
to a new organization I did not know about them, United Hatzalah. I'd like to introduce you to them. Let's roll this video. United Hatzalah is known in Israel as an organization synonymous with saving lives. Its innovative approach to medical emergencies has revolutionized this field in Israel with responses of up to 90 seconds. 90 seconds. 90 seconds. 90 seconds? 90 seconds. Israelis are working to recover and rebuild their communities with the help of a volunteer-based medical organization, United Hatzalah. United Hatzalah. United Hatzalah. United Hatzalah, the most important organizations in the state of Israel that provide emergency response all over the country. Incredibly sophisticated operation, thousands of volunteers. How can people help out Hatzalah, which is doing life-saving work? We need to buy more medical supplies. We need to buy more special monitors. We need to buy more ambulances. We need help to supply our other volunteers who are still working right now, saving lives. Hatzalah has an absolutely paramount, central, crucial role in assuring the state's survival. These are all volunteers. No one gets paid for their work. They're putting their life in danger. And they're running in to save people, risking literally their families and they're doing it because they love Israel, they love humanity, they love, we have Jews and Arabs saving lives together in Israel. We have 700 Arab volunteers who wear proudly the Israeli flag. They are proud to be Israelis. Serving people from all backgrounds. Every nation. Every race. Every religion. Jews, Muslims, Christians, ordinary people. Extraordinary. People just like you who decided to make a difference. To help each other. To save lives. That gets me every time watching that video. So we wanted to have a night to gather. We wanted to have a night of fellowship. We wanted to have a night of inspiration. We wanted to have a night of mourning. We wanted to have a night of resolve. But we're going to do more than that. We are going to save lives in Israel because of tonight. That is our vision. To help us understand the work of United Hatzalah, I'm very proud to have with us the Western Coast Regional Director, Mr. Brad Yellen, to tell us more. Brad. Wow, what a, what a great gathering. Uh, thank you all for coming out, for your support. Uh, Jeff called me. I really thank Jeff Hunt for helping organize this and the words of the President and the Chancellor for their ongoing support of Israel. Um, what they speak about on this campus in, in stark con contrast to so many campuses around the country to educate, to bring clarity to students of the difference between good and evil. I wanna thank Rabbi Hilla Goldberg, who just spoke, who re recommended United Hatzalah and to help out our volunteers, those putting their lives on the line, jumping out of bed at any hour, and put, going under fire to save hundreds of lives and treating thousands more. I also thank Ellie Beer, who you saw on the screens. As a 16-year-old, he started working on an ambulance, and he realized, after going out of call after call after call, that ambulances aren't fast enough to save lives. He realized if there is someone, a baby choking, or someone who has a, a critical allergic reaction, or someone has a cardiac arrest, by the time the ambulance gets there, it's too late. That there has to be a better way. And through innovation after innovation, chutzpah, pushing passion, he was able to totally revolutionize medical first response. He created Uber before Uber was in anyone's head. We used GPS before the smartphone came to the market. And we were able to cut a time from eight to 25 minutes. That's what it takes a typical ambulance to today, 90 seconds in major cities in Israel. 
three minutes all over the country. How is that possible? Because we have neighbors saving lives, because we're able to communicate to people. If there was a kid in a dorm that started choking, how many people would be willing to go there to save their life? We have a doctor I came with. I'm sure she would jump and go. But what if she didn't know about that event? So we have a means of communicating to EMTs all over the country. And joined in this effort, Ellie has inspired 7,000 people, Christians, Jews, Muslims, people from all backgrounds, to be part of this force. So you'll have a neighbor or a person in the office down the block that can come to save your life. So like Uber, but we come to save your life and we don't charge anyone for our services. On October 7th, because he had this force of 7,000 people, when news came in to dispatch, something's going on, incident, incident, faster, faster, faster. We're probably the first people, amongst the first people in Israel to see what's going. This is not, not only an incident or a terrorist attack, this is like a war. And we call people, it was Shabbat. We have, number, very, we have religious people on our, on our group as well. They broke Shabbat because they understood the higher value of saving life. And they ran out to the south 1,500 of the 7,000 people while everyone was running away from danger. They ran head into danger in order to save lives to go under fire, to es um, evacuate people onto helicopters, onto ambulances, serious injury, serious injury, critical, critical, over and over again. Let me tell you about one, about one of our volunteers though. His name is Shalom Avitan, a 22-year-old person, grew up in Britain, was living in Israel. He decided four years ago he wants to join our force and he became an EMT. And he went south when he heard the news from Jerusalem, drove in his, in his ambulance with a, with a fellow EMT, and he was in touch with the army. And they said, please come out to where these kibbutzim are, these small settlement towns all around the Gaza area. Come to Kfar Aza. we need help. We're overwhelmed. There's too much going on. We, we're just trying to get the, the, the military situation under control. And they would bring out body after person after person, injured, wounds, bullets here and there. All day long, he was working on this. From, you know, when he got there at maybe 9 a.m. till now it was 7 p.m. straight. And then at 7 p.m., there was, uh, there was army people that went into this one person's house in Kfar Aza, and they saw there what happened. There was a beautiful family, a beautiful wife and husband. The wife went out to get milk for her two young babies from the, uh, from the uh, protected room. And as she did that, thinking it was a quiet moment, she was attacked raped. Her husband came out to save her. He was also killed. After they did th their whatever they thought that was, they left and the babies must have been sleeping. They were silent in the, in, in the room. When the military people came in, after they secured much of the town, they heard crying babies from the private room, from the protected room. And they took these two babies and they handed them off to Shalom. And Shalom evaluated them and saw that they were quite dehydrated, gave them water, and eventually, through follow up and work, we were able to place their grandparents. Then Shalom continued over the next couple of days, nonstop, three hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. Finally, after three days of constant work, he went back to Jerusalem to take a shower before returning back to the south. Now that's one volunteer 
We had 1,500 volunteers volunteering in the South. And today we have still a very large force in the South. We have field hospitals in North and South, and we're very stretched all over the country. You know, as I was watching and hearing and watching the news like all of us here, the one thing that I, through all the tragedy and, and difficulty and, and heavy heart, one thing I was happy to be able to do was to be able to make a practical difference. You know, you watch, it's like, what can I do? You feel helpless. But with United at Sala, reaching out to partners to help them save lives, because through all that, we depleted almost all of our supplies, not only giving to our own medics, but to army medics that were undersupplied. We wiped out our supplies in days. And we went to order more. And because we're spread out, we need more equipment in the hands of more people, like defibrillators. So I want to tell you that right now, we continue to urgently need help. And I'll explain a number of reasons that I hope that people consider um, helping us, the United Cella, to be our partner in saving lives. First of all, we very much, it could very well happen, we have a multi-front war. And so people, we have enough to handle the South. Those 1,500, we have 1,500 vests, protective gear. But if it happens in the North too, we have to make sure that our medics are protected so they can work on multiple fronts. There's also, like we just had a terrorist attack in Jerusalem, terrorism could step up and we need more help through the interior. And we're very spread thin. We have, normally we have 7,000 people spread out through the country. Now we have forces in the south and the north. And we have a lot of people that went to, onto the reserves. So we need to make sure that we have more equipment for each person ready to go. And we have, um, fortunately tonight, someone was generous enough to give a matching gift for this group, for this campaign of $500,000, up to $500,000. If we can raise this money, he wants to step up and help towards this cause to help save lives. So please. So on your tables, we have sheets. And I'm gonna just take another 30 seconds to talk about three items that are urgently needed, but they're all needed. And if we could take a couple minutes, maybe we could have a few people help get this campaign started. You can certainly bring it home and continue after tonight, but let's see if we can make some progress. Number one is, as I mentioned, the protective vests. We need to be able to make sure we can deploy as many of our medics as possible in a responsible way. Second, we need medical equipment because it was so depleted. There's medical equipment there, medical bags and defibrillators. And third is we need more vehicles to make sure that we can work in urban areas and whatnot. We have small vehicles. We just got a shipment. That's why it's on the sheet. We just got a shipment of another 50 of these mini lances that can carry this equipment and that the volunteer has with them at all time answering some 300, 400, 500 calls every year, but they, if they have them in their hands, so they are ready to go. So if we can take a moment. Yeah. Brad, thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful. So this is where we can do something very tangible right now to support our friends in Israel. As Brad mentioned, a donor in this room has said that they will pledge to match up to $500,000 raised in support of United Hatzala. You can scan right here to donate. Right here online, we now have $3,000. So matched, we've got six. We can get that to a million 
if we're willing to step up and help United Hatzalah. Now, the person that was instrumental in getting this whole night organized was Harold and Diane Smethels. Let's thank them right here. But Harold, had one, you wanted to say something about tonight. Yes, I'm looking forward to buying a portable uh, ultrasound for $10,000. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would be interested in stepping up tonight? Someone who couldn't attend tonight. Somebody who couldn't attend. Thank you, Joy, very much. Another $1,000 for tonight. Thank you, Joy. Great. Another hundred dollars. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Go ahead. A medic bag. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's another five thousand dollars. Wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead. Wow. Another ambulance right here. $55,000. $55,000. That's wonderful. Thank you so very much. That's great. Yes. Portable ultrasound, Will, Christy Armstrong, thank you very much. By the way, Will, Christy, thank you for carrying on the legacy of your father. That's Bill Armstrong's uh, son and daughter-in-law right there. I think your dad would be very proud, uh, very proud of what tonight. Okay, okay thank you so much. Let's just, uh, the protective vests are $800, okay? I want to be able to tell our volunteers that we can do protective vests. You can do one, you can do 10, whatever. But, uh, you know, I want to make sure we have more, more of our volunteers, they have the protection they need. You know, when I talk to the volunteers, what they always tell me is, be sure to go back to our partners and tell them we couldn't do it without them, that they are equal partners with us. Yes, how many, yeah. A protective vest, thank you so much. And thank you. And also another protective vest. Anyone else can do a protective vest? $800. And then we'll close up. Okay. What's your name? Jay? Thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Really appreciate it. We, we, so, what? Faith Church, right? Faith, Faith Church. Church. Faith Church. It's going to do a defibrillator and how many? And five protective, five protective vests. vests. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't want to, they can continue. Uh... Yep. So you can take this home, and if you'd like to consider donating online later, um, would you consider standing to make that commitment to donate online later and to explore this? President Hogue, thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, Brad, you don't know this, but I was talking to my son the other day, and I pay my kids to do things, you know, as you can imagine. Um, you probably do. Um, I said, if you worked really hard, and got to play 10 minutes of game time on the uh, court. So his coach saw him in practice, he worked really hard, the coach approved it, said, all right, you get 10 minutes of game time, I'll pay you 50 bucks. And he said he would match 
and give his $50 to you all today. So but thanks my son Joshua for being willing to do that. He's a great boy. Joshua's a good man too, right? <laughs> well, friends, I wanna thank you again for this evening. We're not done yet. Um, Peter Simon is gonna lead us out in the playing of the Israeli national anthem. Um, during this time, please consider standing, and then afterwards, we're gonna join people out in the uh, quad there for a moment of prayer. Rabbi Hillel Goldberg will be leading us in prayer, and Chancellor Sweeting will be leading us in prayer as well. So please join us for that. I know it's been a late evening, but just a little bit more. Thank you all again for joining us this evening. Peter, take us away. Again, the prayer vigil will be outside. And thank you, Peter.